Hello, and welcome to Testing of High-Risk Drug Components for Diethylene Glycol and Ethylene Glycol, presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Nelson Labs. My name is Mike Auerbach. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of American Pharmaceutical Review, and I'll be the moderator during today's webinar. In this webinar, you'll learn about ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol contaminants and how to test for them. In addition, this webinar will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, click on the Ask a Question tab on the right side of your screen. Please take note, the right side of your screen also features an overview of this webinar and more information about our speaker. If you have a technical question during the event, click the Test Your Connection button at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can access additional webinar support. Finally, we encourage you to use the social media widgets beneath the webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. And now, allow me to introduce today's speaker. Shiri Hector is an organic chemist. She received her master's degree in organic chemistry from Tel Aviv University in 2005. She began her career at Gibraltar Labs in 2006. She started as a chemistry group leader in the analytical chemistry department. After two years, Sherry was promoted to the QA department as a quality assurance deputy with a focus on analytical chemistry. During her time in QA, Sherry completed the Certified Quality Auditor and Certified Six Sigma Greenbelt training with the American Society of Quality and currently holds both certifications. In 2017, Sherry moved back into operations as a Senior Lab Operations Manager. As a senior lab operations manager, Siri oversees all analytical testing, routine and validation, particulate testing, stability testing, molecular biology, and microbial project development, and fills the role as the main subject matter expert for analytical testing, giving support to the technical service teams. Currently, Shiri is part of the Global Pharma Segment Team, supporting the pharma analytical testing at Nelson Labs' new Enhanced Pharmaceutical Center of Excellence in Itasca, Illinois, as a Senior Manager of Scientific and Technical Services. Shiri, welcome to the webinar. Um, thank you for the introduction, Mike. Um, so today's topic, as Mike said, is testing of high-risk drug components for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. And we're gonna talk about um, ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol. What are their properties, the use in manufacturing, health and safety risk and historic background. We're gonna talk about the recent two and FDA guidance on testing high-risk high drug components for ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol. And we're gonna dive into the analytical procedure for testing ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol. So let's start with ethylene glycol. Uh, you can see the structure here. It's an organic com compound. It's the simplest member of the glycol family. It is um, odorless, colorless, inflammable liquid that has sweet taste and is toxic at, toxic at high concentrations. It is mainly used in the industry for two purposes, as raw material for manufacture of polyesters, and uh, for antifreeze formulations. Diethylene glycol, you can see the structure here, um, is a four carbon dimer of ethylene glycol. It is also colorless, odorless liquid, and it also has sweet taste. And it's widely used as a solvent and as a normal ingredient in various consumer products. So in this slide, I detail more about the uses of ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol in uh, the var various industries. You can see that they are widely used and manufacturer uh, uses them either as excipients or in excipients because they're cheap. So they're used for economic gain. Um, what I wanted to highlight here is the two uh, uses or misuses that are highlighted in red. So um, diethylene glycol was historically misused as viscosity modifier in oral and topical pharmaceutical solution and also in personal care products. And it was also misused um, to sweeten wine and beer because it's a uh, sweet taste. And the use of diethylene glycol, uh, both as sweetener and in the oral and consumer health product 
resulted uh, many of the epi epidemic of diethylene glycol poisoning in the early 20th centuries. And, and I'm gonna talk about it later in my slides. Um, health safety risks, ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol are both toxic to human. They're both rapidly absorbed when ingested and this is the predominant fruit of exposure. And when ingesting them, there's serious concentration consequences like coma, seizure, metabolic acidosis, kidney failure, and death. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, diethylene and glycol historic poisoning. Uh, the first incident I'm gonna talk about happened in 1937 in the US where diethylene and glycol used as a solvent um, in antibiotic combination. That caused over 100 people um, dying. Third of them uh, were children. And this strategy led um, the FDA to issue the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in 1938. The other incidents um, were in late 1995 and early 1996, when many children admitted to hospital in, ha in Haiti with sudden kidney failure, and that resulted uh, more than 80 fatalities. Later, they investigated and found that diethylene glycol um, contaminated glycerin was used in the manufacturing of um, acetaminophen syrup that mostly used by children. Also between 1990 and 1998, Similar incidents of diethylene poisoning occurred in Argentina, Bangladesh, India, and Nigeria, and resulted in uh, deaths of 100 children. In 2006, it was found that diethylene glycol has been improperly used, um, replacing glycerin. Um, so instead of using glycerin, they use diethylene glycol as a raw material in variety of sedative syrups and cough medicine. And that happened in Central America. And then in uh, 2007, Chinese toothpaste were fine to contain diethylene glycol. Um, even though there was no um, poisoning in the US um, related to this Chinese uh, toothpaste, uh, the contaminated toothpaste were found in the border um, in the U.S. border and also in two uh, retail stores. So when they came to investigate uh, the causes for dieting and glycol poisoning, they found that the main reason was lack of CGMP controls. And that was due to the fact that uh, manufactured manufacturers relied on the COVA provided by the suppliers of the raw material. They had limited information on the raw material or origin, and they had no traceability and supply chain of custody on the raw material. And the manufacturer did not perform full identity tests to identify the raw material, to quantify impurities like diethylene glycol, um, or to verify the purity of the raw material. So um, recent incidents for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol poisoning. Uh, since two uh, 2022, the WHO issued total of six global medical alerts for over-the-counter medicine contaminated with diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. In this slide, you can see three of them, but these were observed in cases from at least seven countries all over the globe. And these cases were associated with more, more than 300 fatalities, mostly infected were children under the age of five. So the WHO stated, and I quote, this contaminant were identified as toxic chemical used as industrial solvent and antifreeze agent that can be fatal even if taken in small amount and should never be found in medicine. The WHO urges action to protect children from contaminated medicine, and that was released in January 2023 
due to the several incidents um, that were found and caused um, many children to die. Following the 2022 and 2023 reports of overseas death, uh, FDA extend, extensively started interacting with the WHO and other regulator to prevent uh, this contaminated medicine to reach the U.S. Unlike the 2006 incidents that, as we saw before, um, they were resulting from glycerin substitution with diethylene glycol, the 2022 and 2023 incident appear to be related to substitution of propylene glycol with diethylene glycol. So in May 2023, the FDA uh, published a new guidance um, for testing of high-risk drug components for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. And this is the title of the guidance. Um, this guidance was issued without prior notice uh, public comment and took effect immediately upon publication. This guidance is replacing the 2007 FDA guidance on testing of glycerin for diethylene glycol. And the, gu the guidance is important because it uh, gives an important reminder for pharmaceutical and suppliers about the risk of using glycerin or other high-risk drug components that could be contaminated with diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol and is intended to prevent introduction of this contaminated uh, component into the drug supply chain and to save the public health. And in 2003, in August 2003, the FDA uh, started issuing warning letter following this guidance for companies who fail to provide documentation of um, testing of the high-risk drug components for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. In this slide, you can see the increase um, in FDA warning letters in 483s. And you can see that um, in 2023, there were uh, 36 warning letters and 19 for 483s um, issued that were only related for testing, or I should say lack of testing for um, ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, warning letters that were issued and the citations. The first one is uh, from 2023 from a firm in South Korea. And in this case, um, the limit of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol was not performed um, on on all on each shipment and each lot from. Uh, for glycerin and propylene glycol. And it shows lack of control to mitigate uh, risk for contamination. This one is uh, from uh, 2023 also uh, from a firm in the US and it shows similar concerns. Um, the company failed to perform uh, the required test and test for limit of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. And the last one uh, is from 2024, also from the US. And again, it's similar cases when uh, the firm was not performing full identification test on glycerin as required in the new guidance. So again, it shows lack of control to, uh, to assure the safety of the component that is used for manufacturing. So what are the FDA guidance key points? Um, first, they're intended for pharmaceutical manufacturing, compounders, repackers, and suppliers of high-risk drug components. And the FDI define high-risk drug components as components of drug product that through historical experience have been found at a higher risk of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol contamination compared to other drug products high-risk uh, drug components. High-risk drug components um, include all of the components that are listed on the title of the guidance. I listed them here in the slide. And these are the most common ingredient used for manufacturing of OTC allergy and cold cough medicine. 
but it also includes other uh, components that are at higher risk for contamination of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol, where the USP monograph includes it, include testing um, for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol as impurities, like polyethylene glycol, or um, all of the compounds that are listed in the general chapter 469, like polysorbates. So the requirements that are detailed in the guidance. The first one um, is comply with current good manufacturing practices, CGMP regulation, 21 uh, CFR parts 210 and 211. The second is to, trail, to treat the bulk or repackage high-risk drug component as actual drugs. The third is um, to test the identity of each component of a drug uh, product using specific identity tests if they exist on each shipment of each lot, and it should be done before the drug product is manufactured. To have a quality unit responsible for approving or rejecting incoming lots that are used for manufacturing operations. To comply with compendial identification standard for drug, um, including drug components as they have a recognized name in the USP. And also to perform the specific test for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol that is included in the USP monograph. Um, and the acceptable limit is not more than 0.10%. So for example, um, if you look at the glycerin monograph, there's uh, three identification tests. It's not sufficient to perform just identification test A. The manufacturer will have to perform identification test B, which is the limit of the ethylene glycol and ethylene glycol to be in compliance. In addition to the requirement listed above to prevent the diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol contaminated product, um, there are also six recommendations that are mentioned in the guidance for manufacturers. The first one is to perform specific identification tests on all samples from all containers of all lots uh, for the high risk drug components. And this, that is because um, of two reasons. One, because diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol, as we um, stated before, they're very toxic and contamination presents serious hazards. And the second one is that the agency have found a variability of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol contamination from container to container. And that's why um, it is recommended to take a representative a representative sample for testing from each container of each lot. And also this testing needs to be done, as we said before, um, before um, using these components in the drug manufacturing, drug product manufacturing. If diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol tests are not included in the identity test uh, in the USP monograph, a suitable uh, procedure must be developed and it should be able to detect and quantify diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol for a safety limit of not more than 0.10%. It is recommended for manufacturer to maintain current knowledge on supply chain for high-risk drug components, meaning to know the identity of the original manufacturer, repackers or distributors. It is recommended to train all personnel um, in the pharmaceutical manufacturing facility on the importance of testing for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol and the potential hazard if such, such testing is not performed. And that's uh, specifically for those who is responsible for receipt, testing, and release of these components. Um, repackers and other who distribute this component should test um, should test for um, diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. They should provide accurate and complete CLA, identifying the original manufacturer and the test results. 
and 503A compound in pharmacies um, that uses high-risk drug components um, in their compounded drug product should either test each lot of each component for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol content or ensure that this testing is properly performed by a reliable uh, suppliers. So let's talk a little bit about the analytical procedure. Um, that's deta detailed in the USP. It is the limit of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol test. This test is, is either detailed in the specific monograph as identification test or detailed as impurities, um, impurity test for higher risk uh, drug components or detailed in USP 469. The technology that, it that is used is gas chromatography with flame ionization detector. Um, the column that is used is either capillary or packed column, and it has specific dimension and specific phase, and that would be detailed in the specific procedures. Chromatographic parameters will vary between drug components. Um, in this case, I'm going to present identification B. This is from the glycerin monograph. So in the glycerin monograph, identification B, limit of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. The FID detector temperature is set to 250. The injector um, temperature is to 220. The carrier gas is helium with flow rate for about 4.5 uh, ml per minute. The injection volume is one microliter. The split ratio is 10 to one. And this is the oven temperature that is detailed. Um, these parameters can be changed and optimized um, based on USP 621, which is the general chapter for chromatography um, allowances. In this slide, you can see the standard preparation and the sample preparation from um, this specific identification test that's detailed in the glycerin monograph. So the standard solution um, is prepared using um, USP reference standard of the drug component. In this case, it's glycerin, um, ethylene glycol, diethylene glycol, internal standard, and it's prepared in methanol. The sample solution is prepared um, with the internal standard also in methanol. System suit requirements are determined on the standard solution and they are meant to ensure that the system is ready for testing. Um, they detail the, rel the relative retention times um, of each, com of each um, contaminate uh, relative to the glycerin, which is the drug component. So we can uh, identify each contaminant and quantify it. And they also um, specify resolution requirement between diethylene glycol and glycerin. And that's to ensure that there is a big, a good separation between the peaks and we can quantify each peak separately. Even though the USP doesn't specify to perform replicate standard injection, um, some lab will uh, perform it as part of their internal procedures. So they will perform replicate injection of the standard, calculate the percent RSD or run check standard and calculate the percent recovery. And that's again, just to show that the system is ready for testing uh, before we test the sample. This is a representative chromatogram, uh, standard chromatogram. As you can see, um, we see four peaks besides the original, uh, the beginning that it's a solvent peak. We see the ethylene glycol at a retention time of four, internal standard at around eight, diethylene glycol at around 11.8, and the glycerin at 14.4. You can see there is a good separation between the peak and we can quantify each peak individually. Uh, 
Um, we are looking at this test to see if there is any uh, peaks relating to diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol, meaning in the same retention time of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol in the sample chromatogram. In this case, you can see a sample chromatogram um, that there is no um, peaks observed in diethylene glycol at 11.8 or around the retention time of ethylene glycol at four. And the acceptance criteria is that if any peak are observed at the same retention time of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol in the sample solution, the peak response ratio relative to the internal standard is not more than the peak response ratio um, relative to the internal standard from the standard solution. And that would be equivalent to not more than 0 0.10 of each diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. This is just an example for a standard chromatogram for propylene glycol. So you can see the differences um, in the chromatogram. Um, in this case, diethylene glycol, ethylene glycol, and the internal standard elute, um, the retention time is uh, pretty much the same as glycerin. However, the propylene glycol uh, retention time is 4.8. That's um, instead of the one we saw in glycerin, which was uh, around 14. So in this case, um, the system suit requirement will look for a resolution between ethylene glycol and propylene glycol. On October 2023, the WHO also published uh, guidance for testing uh, for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. The name of uh, the standard was test for diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol in liquid preparation for oral use. And in this um, guidance, they identify two tests. One is a screening test for non-compliance and it's performed by TLC, thin layer chromatography. And the other one is confirmatory test that is performed by gas chromatography. And it's similar to the procedure that is detailed in the USP. And the reason why the screening test is um, detailed is to enable companies that do not have access to GC techniques to perform quick um, and dirty tests to be able to identify um, any contaminants in their drug products, in the drug components before they use it for drug product manufacturing. So some of the differences between the two techniques, um, thin layer chromatography is semi-quantified, quantitative, has higher uncertainty. It has less sensitivity. Um, so the detection limit is 0.2%. It, in, it is non-specific, meaning it would not be possible to distinguish between diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol, as both contaminants will co-elute on the TLC plate. It requires less resources, so it's cheap. It doesn't have equipment. And there is a risk for false negative results because it's semi-quantitative uh, and it's not specific. The GC uh, gas chromatography, on the other hand, is quantitative, as we saw before. It has lower uncertainty. It has higher sensitivity, so we can detect, it, we can detect even lower than 0.1%. It is specific, so we can quantify each contaminant separately. It requires more resources, it's more expensive, it requires equipment and operators, and it can be adapted for other excipients testing. The GC test can be performed directly without performing the screening test uh, before. Uh, and that can be used for uh, companies that can perform the GC test. This is an outline of the screening test. We can see here that the diluent is methanol. There is a um, standard uh, solution A, which is the sample solution, and five standard solution, B2F. 
The standard solution are prepared from different concentration of 0.2% to 20% in the diluent. The absorbance is silica, uh, silica gel plate. Application volume is two microliter. The developing solvent system is a mixture of toluene, acetone, and ammonia. And the visualization solution is potassium permanganate, per sodium carbonate, and hydroxide um, mixture. And in this uh, technique, we apply each individual solution on the plate separately in circular spots between two to five millimeter diameter, about two centimeter distance from the lower edge. After applying two microliter of each spot, we dry the plate and we place it in a chromatographic tank as, ver as vertical as possible. We let the developing solvent um, elute and we remove the plate and when uh, the developing solvent reached 75% of between the lower and the upper end of the plate. We take the plate out, we dry it, uh, spray it with visualization solution and dry it again until we see um, yellow spots. Here you can see um, the TLC plate. This is actually from the WHO guidance. They provided this so the testing labs will be able to understand how the TLC plate should look like. In this plate, you can see um, the five standards on the left side from 20% uh, ethylene glycol, diethylene glycol to 0.2%. And you can see that the intensity of the spots decreases as long as the concentration decreases. The system suit in this case is from solution E. Solution E is the 0.5% standard, and it should show a visible spot. So if a spot is not shown in 0.5, meaning something's wrong with the test. You can also see sample solution and then spike sample solution with 1% ethylene glycol, diethylene glycol. And that was meant um, as a positive control. So we can see that um, ethylene glycol, diethylene glycol spot can be detected uh, properly in the sample solution with no interference. And what we're doing is we're looking at the intensity of the spots of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol in the sample solution, if they're present and comparing them to the intensities of the spots um, due to diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol in the chromatogram obtained from solution B to F, which are the reference solutions. And based on the intensity of the spots, we can estimate the percent uh, of combined diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol in the sample and determine uh, if uh, the sample is contaminated, if the drug component is contaminated with diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol or not. And we can then later send the samples for a confirmatory test by GC. So to summarize, diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol contaminants are toxic when ingested uh, above the acceptable limits. The recent contamination and poor quality drug product and excipients led the FDA and the WHO to take action to protect the public from adulterated drugs. Both FDA and the WHO have provided regulatory and testing guidance to help pharmaceutical manufacturer, compounders, repacker, and suppliers of high-risk drug components to identify the products of it or excipients, and they can do it through supplier qualification and appropriate CGMP testing. And stakeholders must adhere to provided guidance and to exercise appropriate controls to mitigate any health or safety risk to the end users. 
Um, this is Nelson Lab New Pharma Center of Excellence, where uh, we perform ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol testing and other analytical tests. And that concludes my presentation for today. I will pass it on to Mike for question and answer. All right. Well, thank you, Shiri. Uh, now it's time to open up the webinar to questions. As you can see, I'm not Mike Auerbach. Uh, I am substituting for him. He is under the weather right now. Uh, but a friendly reminder that if you have any questions to ask Shiri, just click on the Ask a Question tab and uh, type in your question, and we will get to as many as we can. And Shiri, are you ready over there? Yeah. All right. So our first question is, can other analytical methods be used for determination of DEG and EG? Um, so any analytical method can be used, any alternative method, as long as it's um, proven to be accurately quantifying the limit of the ethylene glycol and ethylene glycol and validated um, for other characteristics like specificity or precision. Okay. So the answer in short is yes, but it should qualify as alternative validated method. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Uh, our next question is, uh, why is a specific identity test, a limit of DEG and EG required, if the raw material purity is verified? Um, so... Even though we're verifying the raw material uh, purity, it can be um, different percentage than what the safety allowance of diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol, which is only 0.10%. So in this case, if you have a raw material or a component that has a purity of 99 to 101%, you would not know if diethylene glycol or ethylene glycol limit is exceeded in that API. So it's not enough um, just to perform purity. In fact, verifying C of A, um, supplier C of A, um, the first test that always required our identity test, and those are the full identity tests. Okay, sounds good. Our next question is, uh, what non-toxic solvents have been identified other than diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol? Um, I don't have information about other non-toxins that were identified specifically uh, for this high-risk drug components, um, but manufacturer has to perform uh, USP 467 or other resi residual solvent tests to identify and quantify the solvents that are used in their manufacturing processes. Okay. Thank you. Just a friendly reminder that if you do have any questions, just go ahead and click on the Ask a Question tab and type in your question and we'll get to all of them. All right. Our next question is, why not prepare an ethanol instead of methanol? So um, ethanol and methanol, they're similar. Um, However, in this uh, system, in the, in the GC system, it, based on the preparation of the standards and sample, methanol was um, found to have higher performance, and that's what it's, why it's used as a solvent. Okay, sounds good. Um, I'll just check to see if there's any other questions that come in. If not, we will wrap this up. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, Shiri, for her wonderful presentation today, uh, if you have any additional questions that we're not able to address here, uh, we'll answer those via email. Um, and we would like to also have a special thanks to our sponsor, Nelson Labs, for sponsoring today's live event. We'll be sending out the on-demand link to today's webinar about this time tomorrow. So feel free to share with your colleagues. And uh, yes, thank you again for your time today and enjoy the rest of your day.